This is a job that you start off, if you're somebody who wants to be a detective, you've got to start off the hard way. I was raised in a law enforcement family. My dad was a cop. Uh, he was also at Torrance. He hired on in 61. I was born in his academy. My son, Jimmy, was born in my academy. So it's kind of multi-generational. When I was in high school, I thought I would actually do this for a living, but I got distracted for a number of years and uh, spent some time studying the arts. So I have a bachelor's degree in design. I have a master's degree in architecture from UCLA. And I graduated from UCLA on a Sunday. I was in the police academy the very next day. And I have been there ever since. I just knew that when I was in grad school that although we use a lot of art in the, so what we do in jury trials, and you're going to see the presentations we do today are driven by media. But for the most part, I knew I couldn't do that for a living. And I was already married I was with my, my wife, and I thought, you know, that's not a job for us. So I went back to law enforcement. Now, in law enforcement, you've got to pay your dues. So I spent time in patrol, a lot of years in patrol. And then I came out and did two years in gangs. This is my son, Jimmy, here, this blonde-haired kid. David's a med student at USC, so we're divided, okay? Our house is divided. We have two of us who went to UCLA. Jimmy went to UCLA also, but David's at SC, so he's the traitor in the family. <laughs> now, after just a couple of years working gangs, I actually spent four years working undercover. We were doing uh, dope, big dope deals, big Colombian dope deals, which are major. Key. Oh, I did three years in SWAT, too. I have to mention that. Three years in SWAT. That's fun, by the way. Very fun. But we did these big dope deals where we were getting a bunch of kilos. And I didn't cut my hair for four years. Why well, cut your hair if you don't have to, right? Because you have to have this stupid haircut your entire career, except for those four years. Now, after that, I spent, went right to investigations, and I was working on a robbery homicide. Most of that time, I was not a Christian. And I was the kind of atheist that was really pretty obstinate. And I think I was a pretty well-educated atheist. I mean, I had reasons why I rejected God's existence. So if you're going to come up against atheist objections, I'm pretty sure I held them in one fashion or another when I was an atheist. And I was pretty thoughtful about my atheism. I wasn't raised in a Christian family. I don't have Christians in my family. My dad's still an atheist. Um, but, you know, I, I raised my family. I, was, I got saved when my kids were pretty young. So they don't remember a time when I, when I wasn't a Christian. So that was kind of good for them. So we do these cases that are high-profile cases because they're cold cases. They're only murders. There are no um, cold cases that are anything other than murder. Murder has no statute of limitations. You can do a murder, and I can come after you years later. You do a robbery after a certain number of years, I can't come after you. There's a limitation on how long I can prosecute a robbery. But a murder, I can go after those forever. As a matter of fact, right now, I'm in trial. We're three weeks in. We started three weeks ago. I'm on the, on the stand on Monday, so I have to get back. Uh, tomorrow I fly back to Los Angeles County. And it's a case that from 1979. <clears throat> and these are all cases that have been covered by the media. We've been on Dateline three times. This case we're doing right now is also a Dateline case. They're in there filming every day. So if you do well, you get to do well on national TV. If you lose, you get to lose on national TV. I don't want to do the interview as the loser, okay? Trust me. So I'm hoping that we're going to do well on this case as well. But now we're going to take some of those techniques that we learned doing cold cases, and we're going to apply them to the Christian worldview. There are some skill sets that you can actually employ as a Christian to determine whether or not this is even true. And that's what we're going to do today. Make sense? I'm going to give you some skills to work with, and then we're going to make the case. Today, I still work at our agency. I'm the chaplain now. So now I get to put a gold crosses on my lapel and no one can say anything about it. I get to wear those all the time. This is my son, Jim. He is now a police officer. We're kind of like the um, George Foreman of law enforcement. Do you know who George Foreman is? He's got six kids. Do you know what his six boys' names are? George Foreman. That's right, George one, two, three, four, five, and six. We're kind of the same way. Three guys named Jim Wallace. We've all done the same job. For the last 53 years, if you called the Torrance Police Department and asked for Detective Jim Wallace, Someone's been there to answer the phone. And for the next 30 years, this knucklehead here will be there. He's also uh, on our uh, color guard, so we get to hang out a lot. Now, I think that we have all been doing this job the exact same way. We've carried the same weapons. We've done the same kinds of interviews. We've employed the same kinds of techniques, all three of us, going back 53 years. And I think we can turn a corner now and apl apply these techniques to the Christian worldview. So I'm going to try to give you basically three generations of information. I want to start off by showing you the problem we're facing with young people in the years they attend college. Christians who attend college leave Christianity in large numbers. It's pretty ugly. 
I used to have everybody stand up, and I stood up and I draw something on the wall for you. There's a reason why the numbers are as bad as they are, and they are bad, disgustingly bad. Most young Christians, most young Christians will step away from the church in their college years. Some will come back, but most will step away. And I don't care who's doing the survey, the numbers look bad. They look anywhere from, say, 55 to 80 percent of Christians who claim to be Christians in their freshman year in college will no longer claim to be Christians by their senior year in college. And I don't care if it's Baptists, if it's Lutherans, if it's Assembly of God. I don't care who's doing the survey, if it's Gallup or Barna, if it's the secularists who are doing the surveys. It all looks the same. It's bad. Why is it happening? That's the problem, really. And I want to talk about that a little bit. I think there's a simple math to the problem we're seeing on college campuses, and I'll draw it on this whiteboard for you, okay? Here's the first part of the equation. We're going to add three things. The first thing we're going to add is that students who we send to university, Christian students we send, are really poorly prepared. So we have poorly prepared students. In other words, if I was to ask you, why are you a Christian? Now, this is an unusual group, because you've already decided to spend two weeks at Summit, and you're at the end of your first week. I get it. You guys are probably not in this group. I hope not. But if I ask, I go all over the country speaking at churches and conferences and university campuses. I'm in Ohio State next month. And I can tell you, if you ask Christians, why are you a Christian? You know what you hear? I, and it's the same every time. I can tell you right now what you're going to hear. Well, I was raised in the church. I've always been a Christian. Well, you know, I, I pray to God, and God answers my prayers. I have a sense that God is with me. I have a deep personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I, I uh, know that Jesus has changed my life. I had a transformational experience. Those are all good answers. My dad remarried. He's an atheist still. But his second wife, who he's been with for about 45 years, she's a Mormon. And I have six brothers and sisters all raised LDS. I spent a lot of time in wards growing up. Probably why I was an atheist for as long as I was. But do you know my Mormon friends and family? Those are their answers. They give me the exact same answers. The same answers that most Christians give. Now, none of us as Christians believe that Mormonism is true. So shouldn't our answer to that question be different? A little different? Can it really be I was raised in the church? I, I have a sense that it's true. I've experienced God. They all say that. How about I know it's evidentially true? Because they can't say that. We have to be ready to be able to answer this question. We have to be better prepared. And right now, students are not well prepared. That's the first thing. Second thing. Aggressive, antagonistic campuses. Let's face it, most college campuses are not in favor of Christianity anymore. They're not. If you're unprepared, and then you've got college professors and college groups now that are ready to kick your butt, be ready to have your butt kicked. That's what's going to happen. You're not prepared. You don't go into a fight without training, but you're willing to go to college without training? That's just called stupid. There's a third thing, though, that most of us leave out. And my friend Brett Kunkel, who uh, teaches here also, he's not, I don't think he's in your session this session. You guys know who Brett Kunkel is, though, right? He's always teasing me about my age. This isn't even my natural hair color. You realize, this is a weave I put in to make me look older. You know that, right? <laughs> stupid guy. There's a third, oh, look at that. It doesn't even work. There's a third thing you can't see, and you're never going to know because I can't teach it to you because I have a pen. I'll have to do it in black. There's a third thing. This is the thing that really is the problem, because all of us have it. You have uh, basically innately fallen humans as students. This is the thing no one wants to talk about, but it's huge. You have, we're unprepared, we're stepping into hostile territory, and we have a predisposition as fallen humans to chase our desires anyway. 
Trust me, if you can give me a worldview that explains how we got here and has its own creation story, but it allows me to sleep with my girlfriend without feeling bad about it, I'm gone. I'm in that worldview. So if you're willing to give a student in an antagonistic environment an alternate worldview that allows them to chase their passions, most of us end up over here. And most Christians end up over there. This is what the statistics show. So the, in, in, let's face it, we're, all of us are we're, we're innately fallen to begin with. We all want to chase our passions and our desires, but this is where we get an excuse to do that. And what do you think is going to happen when those things come together? Honestly, what do you expect to happen? That's what happens. See the problem? Now, it's not just students that have a problem in the church in this regard. Because the, when I ask this question of why you're a Christian, Adults are just as bad. So while students are at least bold enough to leave, adults don't leave. Adults just sit there apathetically. We're not willing to engage it really because we're not really all that convinced. It's true for me, but it's not really true. And if that's the case, why should I get all you know, excited about this? Do you see the problem? The problem is true for both of us. Students are leaving. Adults are staying with apathy. We have to move the church in a new direction. That's why we have something like Summit to begin with. You are the church. You're the most important demographic in the church. You're the future. I'm a was. You're an is. That's the difference. When's the last time somebody my age was writing pop music that influenced the culture? Uh, it's not happening anymore. It's people your age who are doing that. You have a voice right now, an opportunity. Don't waste it. Now, if I was to tell you that for the afternoon session, I want to take you on a missions trip. I want us to go downtown to Denver, and we're going to share a very important truth claim with people who have never heard it before. It's going to cost you some money, because every missions trip costs money. It's going to cost you 150 bucks, because after all, we've got to get there. We've got to set up some things. We've got to work with the local organizations. We've got to have food for everybody. It's going to cost something, but every missions trip does. So we're going to ask you to come, give up your afternoon, five hours, $150. It's not going to be easy. We're going to go to the worst part of Denver and we're going to share the truth. Would you be willing to come? You just heard Dr. Noble talk about how charitable we are as Christians. Would you be willing to do a missions trip with me today? Raise your hand if you'll go. The rest of you are going to hell. So raise your hand if you don't, if we're going to go. Okay, I mean, come on. But what if I told you the truth claim we're going to share downtown is the truth about the best dessert, the best dessert that any of us could ever eat for dessert? Okay, if I told you we're going to go downtown, though, and we're going to spend the afternoon talking to people about dessert. After all, we know what the best dessert is, right? You have an opinion about the best dessert? What's your favorite dessert? Shout it out. Fried, someone said fried something. Fried what? Fried ice cream. No, it's not fried ice cream. What else? What do you think is the best dessert? Ice cream? You? Tiramisu. Okay. Anybody else? Cheesecake, I'm with you. Cheesecake's not bad. They're all wrong, though, so far. Go. Your grandma's, your grandma's wrong. Go. What is it? What is that? Oh, bacon. Oh, anything bacon is true. Good point. No, that's not it. The best dessert, of course, as we know, is, is, is chocolate chip cookies. That's the best dessert. Now, it's going to cost you $150, five hours. We're going to spend the afternoon in downtown Denver. Are you guys willing to come with me and do this missions trip? No, that's a stupid missions trip. <laughs> now, now, why don't you want to come with me and do this missions trip? Why is it stupid? It's stupid because it doesn't really, I mean, who cares what your opinion about, about uh, cookies is? That's a stupid thing to even, be care, to, to even be concerned about, isn't it? Think about that for a minute. This is dumb because this is really a matter of opinion. This is the first thing we have to get this morning. We've got to understand the nature of truth. If there's no truth, there's no truth about God. We can't talk about the truth about God until we establish whether there's a truth. And what kind of truth? I know that, Steve, uh, that Scott Klusendorf came and talked to you about relativism, right? We've worked together, so I know he hasn't covered all this material, so I'm going to try to cover it with you. We don't want to go downtown and preach about chocolate chip cookies because that's just stupid. Who cares if they agree with us about it? This is subjective. This is a subjective truth claim. I'm going to test you on this in a few minutes, so be ready. You've got to catch this. This is subjective. Your opinion about chocolate chip cookies, this truth claim does not reside over here in the cookie. This truth claim 
resides over here in the subject who's describing it. It doesn't, rely, it doesn't reside in the object. It resides in me as the subject. It's a subjective claim. You get it? Now, what if instead of doing this, we went downtown and we're going to talk not about cookies, but about a cure? What if I told you there were people downtown right now who are dying of tuberculosis? TB is on the rise, you know. I have TB. I got TB positive from some crook about 10 years ago. But if you're after your 40, if you get TB positive from somebody, they don't even treat you unless you're active. So I'm TB positive, but I'm not TB active. Do you trust me? Well, we're standing awfully close to each other, actually. I am TB positive. No, I'm not TB active. Okay, so don't worry. But the point is, TB is on the rise. And if I told you we could go downtown to a group that's dying of TB, right now they're in a small community, they are treating it with stupid, they're treating it with aspirin and, you know, and, and, and NyQuil and cough drops, but they're going to die of TB unless we get in there and offer them the one cure that cures TB. They don't know about it. They will die without us offering the cure. Would you be willing to spend $150 in five hours of your time to do that missions trip? Yes. What's the difference? The difference is in the nature of the claim. This is isoniazid. Isoniazid is the one true cure for TB. Nothing else will cure it. This is it. Now, the reason why we're willing to go downtown here is because now we're not talking about opinion. We're talking about truth because this truth claim does not reside in me, the subject. It resides in the object here in this vial. This is an objective truth claim. Do you see the difference? My opinion can't make something true when it comes to objective claims. In other words, I could say, well, you know, for me, I hate isoniazid. It's going to hurt. It's going to take a shot to administer isoniazid. I would much rather take my NyQuil. I get a pleasant buzz from it. I don't mind the taste. Well, I don't care. Your opinion that, I said that NyQuil is not going to change as a cure. You can't, your opinion does not make this work. This works because it's in the nature of what it is that's working. It resides in, if you want to know the difference between objective and subjective claims, ask yourself this simple question. Can my opinion change it? Can your opinion change this? Can I change my opinion about this and make it not the true cure? No, because it's an objective claim. Can my opinion change whether or not chocolate chip cookies are the best dessert? Yes. Change your opinion and everything changes. That's because that's a subjective claim. Do you see the difference? I'm going to test you on this, so be ready. And by the way, most churches and most groups I work with will fail the test. By the way, let's go back for a second. Why are we so adamant about we're willing? We think, oh, we feel so good about ourselves, right, if we're willing to go downtown and, and work in this mission field. Because we feel like this would be the right thing to do. Now, I really think there's a reason why most of you don't share your faith like you ought to. Because how many of you in this room right now would consider yourselves to be the Billy Grahams of your generation? In other words, I don't care where you are, you're waiting in a line, you're waiting at a restaurant, you're hanging out with people at your work, you're always sharing the gospel. Now, how many of you are like that? How many of you are always sharing the gospel? I'll raise your hand. Yeah, exactly, right? Nobody in this whole room is sharing the gospel the way you should. I wonder if it's because you've been treating the gospel like a cookie instead of a cure. In other words, if you think that the gospel, that your beliefs about God are simply a matter of your subjective opinion like cookies, you're far less likely to share them. If on the other hand, you believe the gospel is the one objective cure for what's killing all of us, what kind of a person would you be not to share the cure? It's when you're convinced the gospel is objectively true that you're likely to move on it. And if you think it's just subjectively true, you're going to sit on your butt. We've got to make this distinction. That's why we're taking time to do it this morning. Francis Schaeffer was a, a pastor. He uh, really was a great thinker, a philosopher. He uh, had, a, or had a, a place called Le Brie uh, in, in Europe where people would go, kind of like Summit. This has been called like Little Le Brie in some ways. And people would come and learn the truth. He made a distinction about truth claims. He said truth claims are kind of like in a house in our culture where people put all truth claims in the house 
And they, they kind of organize them in the house. All different kinds of truth claims. Mathematical claims, scientific truth claims, moral truth claims, theological truth claims. They're all in this house. Only problem is Schaefer says this house that has all the truth in it is a two-story house. It's not a one-story house. And the second story is where a lot of stuff gets stuck that shouldn't be stuck there. He says the first story is filled with objective claims that transcend all of us. The second floor is filled with opinions, personal, subjective claims. The problem is how do we categorize certain truth claims? So for example, in Schaefer's model, where do you think the culture puts scientific truth? They put it in the first floor. But where do you think the culture puts truth claims about God, theological truth? Yeah, they stick it in the top floor. They say that stuff's all just a matter of subjective opinion. And as the minute they do that, they weaken the truth claim because opinions don't really matter if you think about it. Only objective truth claims matter. We have to reunite this idea and get to one total truth so we understand that the truth claims about God are every bit as objective as truth claims about math. That's important. And I think Christianity has the opportunity to unite all of this. Think about what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, right? He said that you've got to be careful not to build your house on shifting sand. You've got to be careful to build your house on a rock. If claims about God are subjective, they're just shifting sand. If they are objective claims, though, they're like a rock. We've got to decide what are those claims like. Now let's get after it, and we'll do this test. I'm going to give you one more quick briefing, then we're going to do the test together. Here's my, 19, my 2004 Hyundai Sonata. What a beautiful car this is, right? This is a beautiful, wouldn't you all love to have this car? Yeah, nobody wants this car. This is what my daughter calls an old man car, okay? But I, I love Sonatas, and I love Hyundais. As a matter of fact, I'm going to make a claim about Hyundais. You tell me if it's subjective or objective. Here's my claim. Hyundai automobiles are the coolest cars in the world. Oh, you're so quick to judge. Oh, this is a subjective claim. Really? Yeah, you're right. It's my opinion. And my opinion could change this, right? That's why I know it's a subjective claim. Is there a way that this claim could be an objective claim? Think about it. Now, someone in a couple of classes back had a great statement. He said, yeah, if it was the only car on the planet. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. Is there another way we could, this could be an objective claim about Hyundai cars? Air, how would it be about air conditioning? Yes, if I got every car in the world together and I put them all through a shop and I measured how cold their air conditioning made every car and I discovered that Hyundais were two degrees colder than any other car on the planet because of their air conditioning, then this statement would be objectively true. Because it wouldn't be about my opinion, it'd be about the object, the Hyundai car who's got really great air conditioning. See the difference? Good. Now, just to show you how committed I am to Hyundais, I, I, have, uh, I have five. Uh, my son, uh, Jimmy, when he was uh, in college, he wasn't a cop yet. He had long hair like I did, and uh, he needed a car. I got him a Hyundai Access. There he is, staying, standing with his Hyundai Access. And then when my son David went to med school, he needed a car. We got him a Hyundai Elantra. There he is with Hyundai. Since then, I've bought another, uh, um, uh, another Sonata and a, uh, a GX350, which uh, my daughters drive. So yeah, are we committed to Hyundais? Yes. Now, if I made this statement about Hyundais, I'm so committed, Hyundais can fly you to the moon. Objective or subjective? Now, we know it's a false claim, right? So it's kind of throwing you a little bit. But is it an objectively false claim, or is it a subjective claim? Difficult, huh? Can my opinion change this? Make it fly to the moon? No. Therefore, we know since your opinion can't change it, this is an objective claim about Hyundais, but it's an objectively false claim. It turns out if a claim can be true or false, you know it's objective. Subjective claims can't be true or false. In other words, if I said to you, I think chocolate chip cookies are the best cookies in the world, you couldn't say, no, you don't believe that. No, I believe that. You can't, I mean, it can, might, you might be true for you, but you can't say there's a subjectively false claim. It's my opinion. My opinion's my opinion. If, if I say it's so, it's so with a subjective claim. But objective claims can be falsified. 
This can be falsified. Do you see the difference? I'm only offering it because we're going to need it when we take this test. Yes, we know that only spaceships can fly to the moon. Now, let's take the test together. We're going to divide all truth claims into two sides. On one side, we're going to put all objective claims. And on the other side, we're going to put all subjective claims. Now, remember, objective claims are simply the stuff that's true for all of us, whether we like it or not, because our opinion has nothing to do with it. It's rooted in the object we're describing. And subjective claims, of course, are simply matters of opinion. They can vary from person to person because the person decides, the subject decides whether it's true. I'm going to give you a claim for this test. You guys tell me if it's objective or subjective. Are you ready? First claim. Jim's car is white. Objective or subjective? Objective. I mean, I can't change my opinion. I can think, well, my opinion is it's blue. If I go outside and it's white, it's white. So this goes over on this side. Make sense? That's an easy one. That's easy because it involves a claim about something physical. I could see a car. It's physical, right? How about this? White is the best color for cars. Right. Now we've, we've kind of, these are easy. They're involving subjective, um, I mean, I'm sorry, they're involving physical properties. Now let's talk about this. A little bit different. This is an abstract. This is not about a physical reality. This is about an abstract reality, about mathematics. One plus one is two. Uh, objective or subjective? How many say it's subjective? Someone in the very back. You probably have a math knowledge, right? You probably have some reason theoretically why this may not be true. Got it. Now we can argue about that. And I'm more than happy to do that. In what scenarios might this be not, not true? Those are qualifications. But I think we could say that for all of us in our practical daily experience, if you have two pencils, one in each hand, you put them in your pocket, and I asked you how many pencils do you have in your pocket, you're going to say two. And it really isn't a matter of your personal opinion. But it's diff more difficult, because we can make a case about abstracts that makes it a little more difficult than about physicals. Let's go one more step. What about this claim? Now, some of you are thinking that this is so patently false, it has to be objective. How many of you actually like math as most exciting subject? Okay, these are all the weirdos and freaks in the room right here. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. We need lots more people doing math than we need people doing probably other things. But this is definitely a matter of opinion. It goes on the subject side. Now, we've talked now about abstracts. We talked about physicals. Let's take another step, because I think now it gets a little dicier. It's harder. What about this claim? How many say subjective? Raise your hand. Don't be afraid. So how many say objective? Raise your hand. How many say subjective? Raise your hand. So there's some division here. Now again, you don't know the answer to this. This could be a false claim, or it could be a true claim. But can my opinion change how many push-ups I can do? I mean, honestly. If you said Jim could do 1,000 push-ups, and I have the opinion I can do 1,000 push-ups. Can my opinion make it so? No. Can your opinion make it so? No. Therefore, we know this is an ob objective claim, although you're not quite sure whether it's true or false. And by the way, if it could be true or false, you know it's objective. That's one of the definitions. So this goes on this side. What about this? We've moved from physical claims to abstracts. Now we're into metaphysical claims, the nature of reality. How many of you think this is an objective claim? Raise your hand. OK, somebody, how many think it's a subjective claim? Raise your hand. It's not like you know, when we're in a religious environment, the right answer is always Jesus. No, it's not like that. You can actually have a different answer, because a lot of you are not raising your hands, I'm noticing. Either you have no arms, or you're not quite sure. <laughs> right? But you know, can your opinion change that? I could be wrong. I could say God exists, and I could be completely wrong. But my opinion is not going to make it so one way or the other. I can't think about it harder and make it so, or think about it less and make it not. This is a truth claim that is objective in nature. It may be false. We can describe, we talk about that. We're doing that in the next session. But it is an objective claim. What about this one? Oh, now, you guys are not, not sure right now. A lot of you are not sure. It's fine. How many of you think it's, uh, how many of you just right now are just not quite sure? Raise your hand. 
Don't be afraid to. This is the place to do it. I get it. Now, remember, I gave you a litmus test to ask. Can your opinion make it so or not so? No. This could be a false claim. But it's an objective claim that's either true or false. Your opinion can't change it. This is the thing you've got to realize, folks. We have a claim about Jesus that is an objective, transcendent truth claim. We could be wrong about it, but if we're right about it, you dare not sit on this and do nothing with it. This is not like your opinion about desserts. If this is an objective claim and you think it's true, shame on you if you're not telling other people about it. It'd be like having the cure to cancer but not wanting to really offend anybody with it. If this is a true claim, it's an objectively true claim. Make sense? Goes on this side. What about this one? Ooh, oh, no. No, now we've gone from physical claims to abstracts to metaphysical claims to the hardest and most difficult category of truth claims, moral truth claims. Are there any objective moral truth claims? Think about it. Cultures have divided on what they thought was right and wrong for all of history. Now we're going to say something is morally true or false, and we're going to claim it's objective. Is it really objective? What do you think? Is this an objective claim or a subjective claim? How many of you really aren't sure when it gets to these moral claims? Raise your hand. Yeah, I think this is really, I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, I think because we get in this setting at Summit, it's like, yep, that's objective, everything's objective, I'm confident it's objective, but in reality, we're not sure about moral claims. We know from surveying the culture we're not sure about moral claims. Now, let me just offer this to you. If there is a single objective, transcendent moral claim we can agree on, then we're stuck with the objective, transcendent nature of moral claims. If you're wondering, are there such things? You simply have to think about hypotheticals. Is it ever okay to torture babies for fun? Did Scott talk about this? You know that's at least one objective, transcendent moral claim we can agree on. But I would offer this. You might say, well, how about stealing? You should not steal. Really, you can't think of a situation in which you might be morally... Um, uh, virtuous to steal something? If I've got uh, a guy sitting across from me, he's got the code that's going to kill a billion people, and I can simply steal it off of his textbook so he can't set the bomb off, would that not be the morally virtuous thing to do? But if you add a single expression to the end of any of these moral claims, you'll see they're all objectively transcendent. If you say, is it ever okay to steal for the fun of it? No. Now you've removed every single exception. Is it ever okay to kill? Yeah. There are times when it's okay to kill. In California, killing in self-defense, killing to save the life of an innocent, these are called justified homicides. No one's going to take you to trial for those cases. But is it ever okay to kill for the fun of it? No. Never has been in any culture, any time in history, on any place on the planet. That is a transcendent, objective, moral truth claim that has always been true. Anywhere you examine it. Is it ever okay to lie? Well, Rahab lied. She's in Hebrews 11 as a hero in the faith. Why did she lie? To protect the lives of two innocents who were in her hiding. But is it ever okay to lie for the fun of it? No. That's a transcendent, objective truth claim. Here's my point. This is either true or false, but it is an objective claim. It's not a subjective opinion. We could disagree about whether it's true or false the same way we disagreed about whether Jim can do 100 push-ups. But it's an objective claim. All moral claims are objective claims. Do you realize that? It ought to change the way we behave. You realize how bad the culture is when it comes to this? We stink. George Barna's done a survey of the culture, non-Christians, and asked them, are there any objective moral truth claims? Here's what he discovered. In the culture, as far as adults go, only 22% of adults say there's any such thing as objective moral truth. That means that 78% of the culture around us rejects objective moral truth. Everything's a matter of perspective, a matter of how your family raised you. It might be good for you, but it's not good for us. And when it comes to students, 
in the culture who aren't Christians, pretty bad. Only 6% of teenagers think there are any objective moral truth claims. And in the church, it's not much better. As far as adults in the church, it rises a little bit to 34%. That means still you've got 66% of Christian adults do not think they're objective moral truth claims. What do you think they think of when they read what Paul's writing in the letters, what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount? Do they think these are opinions? And when it comes to the church in terms of students, you only get a 3% rise. Only 9% of Christian students in youth groups believe there are objective moral truth claims. We have got to fix this problem. This is a problem. And you ought to know better now. We've talked about it. You should at least know why. These claims are objective. You may not agree with them. It's up to you. It's your duty to sort them out because they are objective claims. Now, let me just move to something. I'm going to give you three lies you're going to hear in the university. You heard one of them from Scott. These are three lies you're likely to hear in the culture today. The first one may seem obvious. Oh, there's no truth. There's no objective truth. Everything's a matter of perspective. You hear it sometimes when, when uh, thinkers in history will say things like this. Truth is what stands the test of experience. Well, if my experience is different than your experience, then my truth is going to be different than yours because truth is what stands the test of experience. Or you might hear it said this way. And I want you to just tell me who you think said this. Believe nothing just because a so-called wise person said it. Believe nothing just because a belief is generally held. Like, you know, you Christians. Jesus was wise, wasn't he? And believe nothing because it's said in ancient books. Like, the Bible's an ancient book, isn't it? You know, believe nothing just because it's said to be of divine origin. Isn't the Bible said to be of divine origin? And believe nothing just because someone else believes it. Believe only what you yourself test and judge to be true. That means that you are the final authority on, it's all a subjective. You, the subject is the final authority. Who do you think said this in history? I don't know you guys know if we were here last year. This was said by Buddha. But how do we know that Buddha said this? Because it's in an ancient book of allegedly divine origin said by a very wise man and accepted generally by lots of people. Do you see the problem with this claim? It, it can't stand on its own two feet. It actually violates everything it claims to begin with. It commits suicide. It hangs itself. This is called a self-refuting truth claim. If someone was to say to you, for example, there is no objective truth, you would ask the question, is that objectively true? Are you saying it's true that there is no truth? There's one objective truth claim that there is no objective truth claim? Do you see how stupid that is? It's a problem. It's self-refuting. The second lie you're going to hear in colleges, I think, and in the culture, is this one. Okay, fine. I'll give you that first one. I'll give you that there might be some objective truth claims we could all agree on, but nobody is smart enough to really know them. I mean, things change all the time. We have a theory about science. We discover something new. It changes. If you don't allow for change over time in terms of just your ideas, we'd never progress as a culture. So clearly, do you think you know something today? You could be wrong tomorrow. Truth can't really ever really be known with any level of certainty. And folks will say, you'll hear it in, in, in famous atheists who have said things like, believe those who are seeking the truth, but doubt those who are so arrogant like you Christians. You're so arrogant. If there is a truth about God, why do you think you have the market on that truth? Why do you think you know what's true about God? Doubt those who find it. And I love this one by Molly Ivins. She says, look, I believe that ignorance is the root of all evil and that no one knows the truth. Do you see the problem? That means everyone's ignorant, right? This is another example of a self-refuting truth claim. If someone was going to say to you, truth can't be known, what are you going to say? Do you know that's true? Do you know it's true that truth can't be known? Apparently, there's one truth you can know that you can't know truth. Do you see the problem with it? It's self-refuting. I'm going to come back to the third big thing also, but I want to kind of work with this for a second before we get there. My students had a, a professor in college who was one of these guys who would reject objective truths or reject that we could have any certainty about objective truth claims. So I told him, and it was in a microbiology class at University of California at, Southern, at uh, Santa Barbara. My son David was there for his undergraduate work. And so I told him, if you want to mess with this guy, I want you to go to school tomorrow and go into this class about 15 minutes late. And I want you to tell this guy, you know, for me, it's hard for me to get up in the morning. For me, the start time for this class is about 
10.45 or so, because I can't get up any earlier than that. Now, this guy who rejects objective moral truths, is he going to be okay with you coming into his class 15 minutes late every day? No, because he believes there's an objective start time to his class that is not a matter of opinion. It's objectively true. It's 10.30. I said also go out and buy his, you know, the books these professors typically offer. They're super expensive, and they change a few lines every, every year, and they want you to go out the next year and buy the updated edition to their book. Forget all that. I said just go on eBay, get a $5 version of the book, bring it in and say, hey, this isn't your book, but I like this book better. It's cheaper. It covers about the same material. Easier to read. It only cost me $5. Do you think he's going to be okay with that? No, because the guy who rejects objective truth thinks there's an objective true, objectively true text for the class. And I said, tell me. Please tell me he's not giving you true, false, or multiple choice questions. He said, oh, yeah, he's giving us true, false, multiple choice tests. Well, how can you do that if you deny there's any objective truth? I would just go in the next time, just go all true, all true, and hand it to him and say, I just did 100% paper. Here you go. Because after all, it's about my opinions on these things. There's no objectively true answer. These are all subjective. As a matter of fact, if this guy did a crime in my city, I could tell you a lot about this guy just from his DNA. Because the objective truth of reality worms all the way down to the level of his DNA. I can tell you if he's a black, I can tell you if he's a male. I can tell you if he's Asian. I can tell you, a day is probably coming when I'll be able to tell you how tall he is from his DNA. But for now, I can tell you some objectively true claims about his ethnicity, about his sexuality, male or female, if just by looking at the true, objectively true nature of his DNA. Objective truth is undeniable, folks. It's like a safe that's falling out of the sky. You can deny it's falling on you, but you're going to get smacked. It's just the nature of truth. Also, guys like this typically have bumper stickers like this on their car. Have you seen this bumper sticker? It's very popular, and it has children. These are its children. They're all kind of similar, because they're trying to make a claim about the nature of belief systems, that basically all religions are equally true. Can't you guys just get along and coexist? My gosh, please, it's a joke. Just get along. Really? Well, here's the problem. These claims of these systems are very much opposed. If you believe in an Eastern kind of belief system, you probably believe in a God that's not personal, an impersonal force. But the problem is Christianity proposes this God is personal. These two things cannot be, both be true. They are directly contradictory. One can be right, the other false. They can both be false, but they can't both be equally true. They can be equally untrue, or one can be true. Same thing is true when you look at the nature of Jesus' deity. My Jewish friends reject, a lot of my friends would say, and I work with a lot of lawyers at, in, in Los Angeles County who are district attorneys, the entire set of DAs I'm working with on this case, they're all culturally Jewish, and they might give you that Jesus was a smart teacher and maybe a wise ancient rabbi, but they would never give you that Jesus is God. Let me go back. This is a claim only Christians make. Now look, these are in opposition to each other. We can both be wrong, but we can't both be right. And Muslims who deny that Jesus even died on the cross have a claim that's just the opposite of ours. We can both be wrong, but we can't both be right. Do you see this idea that all religions are equally true is nonsense. All they can equally be is false, but they can't be equally true. See the difference? Now, the last lie you're going to hear in the culture is one that I think Scott's already talked about when he talked about tolerance. So I want to review it, and maybe I'll give you a different way to think about it. This idea that tolerance has been redefined by our culture to this definition, which is really a bad definition. The idea that everyone's ideas, everyone's view on anything should be accepted equally as being equally meritorious, equally virtuous, equally true. All views shouldn't be embraced as equally true. And if you're not willing to do that, Mr. Christian, Mrs. Christian, then you're an intolerant jerk. Why can't we just get along? You're so intolerant. You won't accept this other view about same-sex marriage, about homosexuality, about abortion. You will not accept us. You have to judge us. If you want to be tolerant, you have to accept our view as equally meritorious. Really? That is not the definition of tolerance. That's just stupid. And by the way, do you think that these folks could hold to this view? No, it's self-refuting. 
What if I came to one of these guys and I said, okay, here's my view. My view is that some ideas stink. Some ideas are good. Some ideas are bad. Some things are true. Some things are false. Some things we should really reject as a culture. That's my view. Can you, Mr. Tolerant, accept my view as equally meritorious to yours? No, he can't. His view is that all views are equal. Well, my view is that all views aren't. But since you think all views are equal, you have to accept my view as equal to yours. But he can't do that, can he? Because I hold the view that all views aren't equal. This view is impossible to hold. You can't be tolerant like that because by being tolerant like that, they reveal how intolerant they are of us who hold the traditional view of tolerance, which is very different. The traditional view requires two people and three Ds. Two people and three Ds to be tolerant. Here's the definition of tolerance, the real definition of tolerance. A fair, objective, and permissive attitude toward those whose opinions, practices, race, religion, nationality, etc., differ from yours. You don't, in other words, you don't agree. You don't think they're equally meritorious. You hate their views. They're different than yours. To be tolerant, that's the definition. It requires three Ds. Are you ready? The first thing it requires is a disagreement. I'm not asking, if you have to agree with somebody in order to be tolerant, what's there to be tolerant about? We agree. You don't tolerate people who agree with you. You tolerate people who disagree with you. The second D you need is a very strong understanding of what the differences are. What's the difference between same-sex marriage and natural marriage? What is the difference? We have to understand the distinctions. And the third thing you need is the third D. Don't be a jerk. I think, didn't uh, Ryan Dobson come in here and basically talk about that? Okay. So you have to have these three Ds to be truly tolerant. Hold on to your disagreement. Do not relinquish your position. Do not accept theirs as true when you know yours is. Let the disagreement elaborate the, dis the differences, and then finally, don't be a jerk doing it. Three Ds. Now, before we leave this session, I've got to define for you truth, and we'll end right here. What is truth? Because there are some definitions you're going to get in, in university systems that are not true. There's the first one. Could it be, this, let's back up here, I'll give it to you slowly, did you write it down? It's called pragmatism. Pragmatic theory of truth. Pragmatism basically just argues that if, it's, if it works, it's true. Why is isoniazid the, the, the true drug that cures TB? Because it works. We tried a lot of other stuff, this one works, therefore if it works, it's true. That's gonna be offered to you by the culture. But think about it for a second. Always look for counter examples to see if something is true. Does death work for you? Doesn't work for me, and I'm 53 now, and I'm getting, you know, I'm, I'm, it doesn't work for me. Is it still true? Yeah. How about this? Have you ever told a convenient, successful lie? Susie, am I losing my hair? Oh, no, you look as good as you ever did. Your hair is so full. What's she going to tell me? Do I look fat in this dress? What am I really going to say here? Have you ever told a lie successfully? Yes. Did you telling the successful lie then make it true? No. It might work, but it's not true. I can't use the pragmatism. How about this? This is something that's called empiricism. It's the idea that I can't know something is true unless I can test it with my own senses. Now, we already know that some things are subjectively different. You might say something is sweet while somebody else says it's bitter. But let me just offer this to you. If someone makes this claim, the claim that I can't know something is true unless I discover it with science, how many of your friends are like that? Or maybe you even held that position. I can't know something is true unless it's demonstrated with science. I can't know something is true unless I can test it with science. This is empiricism in its purest form. Our culture, for the most part, says this all the time. But let me ask you a question. This claim about truth, can I test it with science? Can I test this claim that you can only know something by testing it with science? Can I test that claim with science? No. 
This is a philosophical position. This is not a scientific statement. This is a philosophical statement. It turns out that all science begins with philosophy. So the idea that science, because science has to have an idea about what's in bounds and what's out of bounds, that's a philosophical distinction. You cannot know this truth scientifically. This is a truth you accept philosophically as the foundation for your science. So therefore, it's self-refute. This statement is self-refuting. It cannot be determined with science. So apparently you do believe in something that can't be determined with science. You believe this. See how it doesn't work? What about this? Emotivism. A lot of my Mormon family, this is how they determine Mormonism is true. Just read it. Pray to God. God will answer your prayer. It's in James. If you want knowledge, just ask for knowledge. God will give it to you. And I've had some experience which confirms this. Truth is what I feel. Really? Have you ever had irrational fears? I have a partner who's six foot four, about 280 pounds, and he's got an irrational fear of garden spiders. It's hilarious. Every time we find a garden spider, we bring it to work. And we put it in a little piece of Tupperware, and we put it on his desk. And he comes in, and when he first notices the spider, he screams like a schoolgirl. He's a huge guy. He's got hands like baseball mitts, okay? But he screams like a schoolgirl when it comes to spiders because he's got an irrational fear. Can you really trust your heart? What does the Bible tell us about your heart? It's wicked and deceitful, right? And by the way, what can your emotions tell you about paper clips? There are several truth claims related to paper clips, their shape, their construction. Can your emotions tell you anything about that? No. There are lots of truth claims that have no emotional component whatsoever. Emotions can't tell you the truth. Here's the definition of truth you need to hold on. It's a biblical definition. It's a simple one. It's called the correspondence theory of truth. Truth is a relationship. I don't mean your relationship with Jesus. I mean truth is a relationship between what you think is true and what really is. If I think there's a podium on this uh, stage, and I'm outside, and then I come inside and I see there really is a podium on this stage, the fact that my beliefs about the existence of a podium match the reality of the existence of the podium, that relationship between my beliefs corresponding to reality is called truth. It's a correspondence relationship between your beliefs. It basically is this. What you believe equals what is. That's truth. 